You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome to the 365th episode of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. As we work our way through the fighting that took place on July 3rd at Gettysburg, we've already looked at the action at Culp's Hill that morning, and now, next, we're going to move out to East Cavalry Field. The Confederate Cavalry Commander, Jeb Stewart, had arrived at Gettysburg the previous day, on the afternoon of July 2nd, after his long ride around the Army of the Potomac. Stewart arrived just in time to witness the climax of some combat at Brinkerhoff's Ridge on the far left flank of the Confederate Army, where Federal horsemen from Gregg's division had pinned down the rebel infantry of the Stonewall Brigade, preventing them from participating in the fighting for Culp's Hill that took place on the evening of the 2nd. Stewart had spotted good ground for mounted operations one ridge line to the east. He also knew that Gregg's troopers held the important Hanover and Low Dutch Road intersection, blocking a direct route into the rear of the Federal Center. Stewart realized that if he could defeat the Union cavalry holding the intersection, he could dash into the enemy rear and wreak havoc. And so, on July 3rd, Stuart's ambitious offensive thrust resulted in a giant clash of horsemen on East Cavalry Field, featuring artillery duels, dismounted fighting, hand-to-hand combat, and, arguably, their most dramatic cavalry charge and countercharge of the entire war. However, however, before we get to all of that, we want to be sure to set the stage for y'all for that fight at East Cavalry Field. And to do what that will take some time in this episode and the next to look back at Stewart's controversial ride to Gettysburg. We used quite a few members episodes, in fact 10 in all, to look at Stewart's ride in some detail. So we didn't really talk about it that much here on the regular episodes. But as Tracy just said, we thought it might be worthwhile to take a show or two here now to fly through that story low and fast so that you guys at least have some idea of what went on before Jeb Stewart and his men showed up at Gettysburg after the battle had already started. In late June 1863, Major General James Yule Brown Stewart and three brigades of veteran Confederate cavalrymen began a fateful ride into enemy territory that has been one of the most hotly debated topics of the Civil War ever since. Long before his death in 1864, Jeb Stewart had become the stuff of legend. His deeds were so daring and his style so appealing that he became the beau ideal of the Southern warrior. It helped that in those days, in most people's eyes, a cavalryman was the single most exciting figure in uniform. Jeb Stewart was 30 years old in June 1863. He was an 1854 graduate of West Point, where the superintendent at the time, a fellow named Robert E. Lee, 
knew the young cadet well. When Virginia seceded in 1861, Stuart resigned his commission and became colonel of the 1st Virginia Cavalry Regiment. He became famous almost immediately after leading a charge at the First Battle of Manassas in July 1861. Stuart was promoted to Brigadier General in September 1861 and gained immortality for his so-called ride around McClellan during the 1862 Peninsula Campaign. A promotion to Major General followed in July 1862 and he assumed command of the Cavalry Division of the Army of Northern Virginia, a post he held until his death. As y'all will recall from the Chancellorsville story arc, Stuart assumed command of Stonewall Jackson's Corps after Jackson was severely wounded by friendly fire at the end of the second day's fighting there. By all accounts, Stuart performed superbly under extremely adverse circumstances. Jackson's corps bore the brunt of the fighting at Chancellorsville, and Stuart, who had never before commanded infantry, played a major part in the Confederate success. Stuart reportedly wanted, but did not receive, permanent command of Jackson's corps after Chancellorsville. Instead, Robert E. Lee reorganized the Army of Northern Virginia from two infantry corps to three, and promoted Dick Yule and A.P. Hill to Lieutenant General, assigning them to command the new corps alongside Lee's old warhorse, James Longstreet. Some historians have speculated that Stuart was desperate for his own promotion to Lieutenant General, and that he felt slighted by being passed over for promotion and corps command. On June 9, 1863, the Federal Cavalry got the drop on Stuart at Brandy Station. The Yankee horsemen nearly defeated their Confederate counterparts in a day of fierce fighting that became the largest cavalry battle in American history. The Richmond newspapers roundly criticized Stuart for being surprised at Brandy Station, and this negative press didn't sit well with him at all. In the wake of his nearly disastrous June 9th battle with the Yankee horsemen at Brandy Station, Stuart redeemed himself by actively and diligently screening the movement of Lee's army toward the Potomac River as the rebel infantry headed north for Pennsylvania. In Virginia, in the Loudoun Valley, at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville, Stuart successfully fended off the Federal Cavalry's attempt to punch through the screen of rebel horsemen as the Yankees tried to find the main body of Lee's army. He didn't win every fight, but nevertheless Stuart managed to succeed at preventing the enemy from locating the rebel infantry as it tramped northward through the Shenandoah Valley. As the Army of Northern Virginia moved toward Pennsylvania, Robert E. Lee assembled seven brigades of cavalry for the campaign. This was the largest mounted force gathered together by the Confederacy to date. Those seven brigades were commanded by Brigadier Generals Fitzhugh Lee, Wade Hampton, William Grumble Jones, Beverly Robertson, John Imboden, and Albert Jenkins, and Colonel John Chambliss, Jr., Chambliss was temporarily commanding in place of Brigadier General Rooney Lee, who had been wounded at Brandy Station. Stuart was searching for ways to make his cavalry command useful after the engagements at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville. He actually already had an idea in mind. He would later write, quote, I began to look for some other point at which to deliver an effective blow. I submitted to the commanding general the plan of leaving a brigade or so in my present front and passing through some gap in the Bull Run Mountains, attained the enemy's rear, passing between his main body in Washington, and cross into Maryland, joining our army north of the Potomac. In other words, Stuart wanted to take most of the Confederate cavalry cut away from the main body of the Army of Northern Virginia ride around the Yankees, and then link back up with Robert E. Lee somewhere north of the Potomac River. 
Some historians have speculated that the criticism leveled at Stuart after Brandy Station led him to look for a way to redeem his now tainted reputation and regain his accustomed role as the darling of the Southern newspapers. These historians claim Stuart wanted to do something spectacular in order to regain the limelight that he had lost in the wake of his nearly disastrous June 9th battle with the Yankee horsemen at Brandy Station. According to this school of thought, Jeb Stuart now saw a seemingly golden opportunity to recapture the glory of his two previous rides around the Army of the Potomac. However, regardless of his motivation, ultimately the buck stops with Robert E. Lee because the Confederate commanding general approved this idea of Stuart's. Lee himself, in his report of the Gettysburg Campaign, would write, quote, Upon the suggestion of General Stuart that he could damage the enemy and delay his passage of the river by getting in his rear, he was authorized to do so. Cutting right to the chase, in his post-war writings, Colonel Edward Porter Alexander, the artillery officer in Longstreet's Corps, made the observation that, quote, Stuart made Lee a very unwise proposition, which Lee, more unwisely, entertained, end quote. Lee's final orders to Stuart were issued on the evening of June 23rd. Although no copy of this message has ever been found, we can assume that, building on earlier communications, it would have given Stuart the discretion to ride around the Army of the Potomac and to try to wreak havoc in the enemy's rear. After doing what he could in that regard, the orders also would have impressed upon Stuart the need to, as quickly as possible, then link up with Yule's Corps somewhere in Pennsylvania. Yule's Corps would be leading the Confederate advance into Pennsylvania, and Lee wanted Stuart screening Yule's front and his right flank, the direction from which the Federal Army would be approaching. And the more mobile rebel horsemen were also instructed to help Yule's foot soldiers there in enemy territory with the important task of collecting foodstuffs and forage for the army's use. Stewart's orders authorized him to take three brigades with him in making this movement, so he decided to take the three veteran brigades of Hampton, Fitz Lee, and Chambliss. He left behind Robertson's and Grumble Jones's brigades to continue to guard the passes over the Blue Ridge, while Imboden's and Jenkins' commands, which weren't regular Confederate cavalry, would move north with the rebel infantry. With his three best brigades ready to start out early on the morning of June 25th, Stuart sent 16-year-old Private John Park of the 6th Virginia Cavalry off on the night of the 24th to carry a message the 30 miles to Robert E. Lee's headquarters. That message would be the last that Lee would hear from his cavalry commander until Stuart showed up at Gettysburg over a week later, on July 2nd. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. 
And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. So given the high stakes that were involved in his invasion of Pennsylvania, why did Robert E. Lee let Jeb Stuart ride off away from the Army? Well, he shouldn't have. And although we're saying that with the benefit of hindsight, we don't think you need the benefit of hindsight to know that Robert E. Lee shouldn't have let Jeb Stuart ride off away from the Army. Previously on the podcast, Earlier in the campaign part of the Gettysburg story arc, we talked about how important it is for a military commander to have good, reliable information about the enemy. The flip side of that is that you, as a military commander, want to keep your opposite number, the enemy commander, from getting that same kind of information about your army. Here, we're talking about intelligence-gathering activities and counterintelligence activities. Exactly. And Lee's intelligence plan for the Pennsylvania campaign placed heavy reliance on Stuart and his veteran cavalry. Since Stuart had performed intelligence activities capably since early in the war, Lee had faith in the timeliness and accuracy of his reports. In this campaign, since his own army would be strung out over long distances during the march up into Pennsylvania, it was vitally important for Lee to know the location of the Federal Army and know when and where the Yankees crossed the Potomac. Lee needed to have this information so that he could know when and where to concentrate his own dispersed forces in order to meet the enemy and give him battle. Given his reliance on Stuart for intelligence and counterintelligence activities, it was a mistake for Lee to let Jeb ride off away from the Army. In such a high-stakes operation as the invasion of Pennsylvania, with so much riding on the outcome of the campaign, Robert E. Lee should have done everything in his power to give himself the greatest chance for success. By allowing Stuart to ride off, Lee did not do this. Given the importance of Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania and the critical role he expected Stuart and his cavalry to play in the campaign, the Confederate commander ought to have given Stuart clearly spelled out orders, which would have ensured the rebel horsemen carried out their assigned tasks of screening Ewell's advance and keeping close tabs on what the Federals were up to. But instead, Lee endorsed Stuart's scheme to ride around the rear of the Yankee army before he linked up with Ewell in Pennsylvania. As should be obvious by now, we think this was a huge, monumental, critical mistake on Lee's part. Given the high stakes involved in this campaign, Lee simply shouldn't have let Stuart ride off away from the army. June 25, 1863, proved to be a fateful day for the Army of Northern Virginia. By 1 a.m. on the morning of the 25th, Jeb Stuart had his column underway. Riding with Stuart were three of the four best cavalry brigades in the Army, totaling between four and 5,000 men, including six pieces of artillery. Remaining behind to guard the Blue Ridge Passes would be the two brigades of Beverly Robertson and Grumble Jones. Truth be told, Stuart had a low opinion of Robertson and didn't like Grumble Jones, although he at least respected Jones' abilities as a veteran officer. Robertson and Jones were expected to join the main body of the army after the last of the Confederate infantry had exited the Shenandoah Valley, heading north into Pennsylvania, and after the Federals to their front had moved north in pursuit of the rebel army. 
In other words, Robertson and Jones were supposed to remain in position until the coast was clear, then follow the rest of the army up into Pennsylvania. Exactly. And in addition to leaving behind Robertson and Jones, Stuart knew that John Imboden had 2,000 mounted infantry who could cover the army's left, while Albert Jenkins commanded another large force of horsemen who were accompanying Ewell's columns as Ewell spearheaded the Confederate advance into Pennsylvania. However, neither Imboden's men nor Jenkins' command were regular Confederate cavalry and so shouldn't have been counted on to carry out the duties of Stuart and his veteran horsemen. Nevertheless, in riding off with his, la- his three best brigades and leaving behind the second string, so to speak, Stuart was obviously counting on the fact that between Robertson and Jones and Jenkins and Imboden, Robert E. Lee would still have thousands of rebel horsemen still at his disposal, and that this, even in Stuart's absence, would be a sufficiently large force for Lee to call upon to meet any need that should arise until Stuart and his men rejoined the army. However, while that is probably exactly what Stuart was thinking, his judgment in this matter, when weighed against the reality of the situation, is just as questionable as Lee's decision to let him ride off, ride off in the first place. And that Lee's judgment was questionable can be seen in the fact that when Stuart set off early on the morning of the 25th, Robert E. Lee certainly would have expected, realistically, to lose contact with his cavalry commander for several days, even under the best of circumstances. Once he started out, Stuart couldn't, realistically, hope to cover the intended distance and link back up with the army somewhere up in Pennsylvania in less than three or four days, all the while deep in the enemy's rear and without any means of regular contact with Lee. Stewart's intended route covered about 110 miles from his starting point at Salem, Virginia, to the neighborhood of Hanover, Pennsylvania, where he would have expected to gain solid information about the exact whereabouts of Ewell's Corps as it spearheaded the march of Lee's army into the Keystone State. This 110-mile ride would take a minimum of three days, likely four, without even accounting for any delay caused by unexpected complications. And, as we'll see, right from the start of Stuart's ride, there were unexpected complications. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is The Maps of the Cavalry in the Gettysburg Campaign by Bradley M. Gottfried. This atlas, only recently published in 2020, is an excellent companion to a previous book recommendation, Gottfried's The Maps of Gettysburg, with this one focusing on the mounted operations of the two armies, from Brandy Station on June 9th, all the way through Falling Waters on July 14th. Don't forget you can find a list of all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Also at the website, you can find information on joining the Strawfoot Brigade over on Patreon and supporting the podcast in that way. Just yesterday, we released members episode 122, which is the first of a two-part look at the famous defensive stand of the 9th Massachusetts Battery at Gettysburg on July 2nd. We want to give a shout out to the newest members, Matthew S., Stephen G., Juan M., Michael S., Niels K., Griffin C., Mark J., and Adam K. And thanks to Jeffrey L., Robert B., Chris D., and Ander P. for their donations. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope that you'll join us again next time. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.